where history is defined by great men, it seems more like you can actually define history by social dynamics. Mm -hmm. Hey everyone, welcome back to Mind Matters. I'm Harrison Cayley, joined by Adam Daniels and Elon Martin. <clears throat> Today, we're going to talk about not just this book, but uh, this guy and his work, Peter Turchin. This book came out a few years ago, 2016 actually, Ages of Discord, A Structural Demographic Analysis of American History. He's got a few other books, um, including War and Peace and War and secular cycles. Some of them are pretty academic, some are more approachable. This one has some sections with math that you can probably skip over if you don't like equations. Um, and I don't. So, but I still write them anyways, try to understand them. We'll get into that, but I want to talk a bit first about how I found this guy's work. Um, I was listening to a podcast, one of James Lindsay's podcasts on New, on new Discourses. I think it was called something like, uh, oh, what was it? Something about the rise of like an overproduction of fake elites or something like that. And he mentioned Turchin's work. He said he wasn't actually familiar with Turchin. He'd heard of him and, and heard his some of his ideas briefly described, but then gave his take on one of the problems that was going on in, well, in just society in general, but which he noticed when he was in the university system. And that the way he described it, Lindsay, he described the that a lot of people would <clears throat> get into get into education, go to school, and get an advanced degree, and then therefore expect that they would be rewarded for it. Essentially, they expected the new status that should come along with getting that degree. And he goes into a lot more detail, but I'll, I'll just leave that there and then get into what Turchin says. Turchin calls this elite overproduction. And this idea, just the brief description of it that Lindsay gave, um, inspired me to find Turchin's work and uh, read this book and get his other ones too. Because one of the things that, it's just a, a short bit in Ponderology that Lobachevsky talks about. He, he talks about socio-professional uh, adaptation or adjustment. The idea that people should ideally fit in their profession. That if you have someone that is too smart, you know, you basically if you take some like genius level person, like genius level creative person, or just a genius level like scientist type person, and you put them in a like a, a wage labor job, but they're not going to they're not going to feel like they're in the right place. They're gonna they're going to know that there are socio-professionally downwardly adjusted, that they're going to be um, in a lower position than they, than they should be. And on the opposite side of, of, uh, of that equation, you've got people who are incompetent and untalented who might be in positions um, that are kind of above their station. So you might have uh, a, a manager or a, or a leader who really is incompetent, who, who is in over his head. And so Lobachevsky points out that if in that latter case, when you have a person like that, they, because they're kind of aware of their own deficiencies, they then feel the need to hide their deficiencies and they become like uh, essentially little tyrants, like in the office place or, or elsewhere. They, because they have to kind of like enforce, they have, they have to, they have to enforce a rigid, um, like work environment in order to maintain their position so that their incompetence isn't revealed, and so that none of their underlings who are actually smarter and more competent than them um, take their place, essentially. So you get this um, You get this when, well, oftentimes through cronyism or, um, or just fraud, but oftentimes through cronyism, through political maneuvering, and, you know, where it might be in a political system where positions of influence are doled out through like a, almost like a patronage system so or a family system like nepotism so this there's this opening in this uh corporation or there's this position and so i'm going to put my son into that position perhaps regardless of whether he's competent at all in that in that position and so you get uh, strategically like throughout a society you'll have positions with 
just incompetent people who are only there because of their political connections. And whereas ideally, those positions would be, um, there would be a selection procedure and like, it's pretty automatic where people get placed where they're, where they fit best. So um, ideally you should have a person in a place that is like matched to their competence. So if a position requires a certain level of education or competence, then I, then naturally that's the person that should get that job, get that position. But the thing that Lobachevsky said is that when you have a whole bunch of people who are downwardly adjusted, so who are um, beneath their station, then that breeds revolutionary sentiment because these people are disaffected. Um, they start dreaming of themselves um, in, in, a position, in a position where they should be, dreaming, dreaming of themselves in a position of influence and power, and that can even go overboard to the point where they project themselves into positions that are that are greater than their actual abilities. So even though, even though they may be relatively more, or they, they relatively talented and more talented than their position would, you know, seem to indicate, they'll imagine themselves to be even more talented than they are. And when you combine that with a revolutionary situation, then you get a, a group of disaffected, um, you know, immiserated people who think that they can change the world for the better put themselves in a position where they can change everything. And basically that's too much for them. They're not cut out for that. In, in which case they will then become the, the upwardly adjusted persons where they, they are put, they place themselves into a position either just in their mind in their dreams or in reality, in the case of a revolutionary takeover of being the incompetent people who, who think they know what they're doing, but who can't. So he said that it would be a good idea to come up with a, <clears throat> a social adjustment indicator, like an index, like a, kind of like a value between negative one and one. And the closer to one it is, then that's the, that shows a pretty healthy society where people are relatively or perfectly placed. That's never going to happen, of course, but the closer to one, the more, the, the more healthy, the more, the more healthy the whole society is in the placement of its individuals. And then anything in the negative would be a potentially revolutionary situation. And so he just throws that out there as an idea and doesn't really um, develop it or go much further than that. But so, so I was, so with that in mind, hearing this idea, um, kind of got me interested. So I read this, read this book. So this is one of his more recent ones. Uh, the, the other ones I mentioned, secular cycles and war and peace and war are, um, a bit older. And in this, he, he uses this, this framework, uh, structural demographic theory. And it was, in its first form, it was de developed by a guy, I believe his name is John Goldstone. Um, I can check the name. Yeah, John Goldstone, who's written, done work on um, revolutions and uh, these kind of secular cycles beforehand. But then Turchin kind of refined it and, um, you know, put a few, few more details into it and, and then tested it empirically. So what Turchin does, and he continues to do this, um, in various different contexts is just like gets a whole bunch of data on all kinds of civilizations and uh, for like historical and present day uh, all these kind of metrics and what's going on population wise and with wages and with um, public well-being and trends among the the ruling class and all this stuff and kind of gets all the data and then graphs all these trends and so it's really interesting if you like looking at graphs I do <laughs> but the, the the core idea is to 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 understand like in the like in the title war and peace and war this cyclical nature of of history and why so why societies or empires rise and fall he calls it imperial pathosis and imperiogenesis the creation and uh, pathology and like decay of empires and in this book he looks specifically at american history so from the 17, late 1700s to the present. And one of the factors, one of the important factors is this thing that I mentioned, elite overproduction. So it's called structural demographic theory because uh, demography is uh, a big part of it. Basically population changes, population growth, population decline, <clears throat> and the effects that has, um, the, the knock-on effects that has on various aspects of society. And one of those well, like a, a facet, a subfacet of that is elite overproduction. So the way Turchin describes it, 
I mentioned Lindsay's example from university of a whole bunch of whole bunch of people, maybe maybe perfectly qualified, maybe not perfectly qualified, getting advanced degrees and then not being able to get a job, basically, because there's too many of them. Elite overproduction is the same thing. It's it's when the <clears throat> the pool of potential candidates to enter the elite kind of ruling class is too big for the for that society to to carry, to handle. So the way this plays out. In the, in the example of American history, for, for the last, uh, probably, probably for most of American history, at least for the past 150 years, I think, the elite, uh, the elite ruling class, the, 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 biggest, the biggest demographic um, like segment of the elite ruling class is lawyers. So you go to law school, you become a lawyer, and chances are you'll get like, well, not chances are, but um, you, most politicians, for example, or uh, I don't know if it's most, but a significant, like the, the biggest chunk of politicians are lawyers or have advanced law, like law degrees. And um, you can just, I, I'd, I'd kind of known that, but not explicitly. But then, you know, I started noticing all the, all the lawyers that are, they get into politics and it's just a, it's a natural, that's just the, the, the course that seems to take place in, a, in American society is that you get uh, if you want to go into politics, uh, a good way into that is to get a law degree. And so looking at all of these trends, you'll find in American history that um, there's, well, there's a lot of things that go together. But So this is just one kind of slice of what's going on. But as, as things are going well in society, so you might call these like good times, um, happy times, well, like prosperous times, you'll see that um, oh, well, part of that is that, uh, inequality starts to rise. So the, so there will be, well, I think you, you can measure this by the Gini coefficient or whatever, but the, the rich will get richer and the poor will either stay the same or maybe get poorer or just get richer at a, at, at a lesser or at a slower rate than the rich. So people not among the elite then look up and see, oh, well, if I want to become, if I want to become rich, I just have to get a law degree and I'll, I'll, I'll become a lawyer and then I can, I can become, you know, part of the, part of the upper classes or through some other means. It might be through a different advanced degree. It might be like becoming a doctor or a dentist at various times in history. And what you see is that all of a sudden, like in, in a society, you'll have a greater number of people applying or going to school for these sorts of things. And as that happens, so you've got like, let's say that they're just, it's an absurd number, but let's say that there's a hundred lawyers, like in a country, it's ridiculously low, but just to think about it, a hundred lawyers. And then all of a sudden you have like 500 people that are, that are becoming lawyers and, um, and all of them now wanting to, to be part of this ruling class. Well, what are the 100 existing lawyers going to do? They're going to be like, well, no, um, because that means a, a, a smaller slice of the pie for me. So what, what that leads to is, um, elite competition, intra elite competition. So you get this new pool of people who who are trying to enter the the upper class, and but there's too many of them, so they can't all get get positions. And this is this shows in not e not in the not even in the in the realm of um, of actual politics, like getting into the actual ruling class, but just in the the example of uh, of lawyers. You look at how many lawyers there were, what the like average. Um, salary was, and it'll be pretty high. And then as more and more people start becoming lawyers, th then the, the salary starts, starts lowering and then it, it, it bifurcates. So you still get a, you still get a, a giant, like uh, or a large, you know, a big salary for a lot of lawyers, but then you get this, this clump that's at like 30 to 50,000 a year. These are all the people that, that, that get their degree, go into a law career but get like crappy starting positions where they make, where they don't make very much money at all. And so they're, now they're left out from, you know, they were hoping to be one of those lawyers that becomes partner and makes a big salary, but they're stuck making like, you know, not much more than they would if they would have got a job that doesn't require a, a, like a degree. So this is just one aspect of this. Um, there are, I'll, I'll talk a bit more about this, what happens within the, this elite. Um, the elite dynamics like that Turchin calls it. So you get this elite overproduction, which then leads to intra-elite competition. And one of the symptoms of intra-elite competition is, um, ex what, what do they call it? Excessive consumption or, uh, 
um, something consumption where you are demonstrative about your consumption. So you get people that uh, you know, like rich people will buy even more like ostentatious things and display their wealth and um, and just spend ridiculous amounts of money to 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 show that they that they are the the wealthy ones. They are the, the upper class to distinguish themselves from these you know upstarts coming in and trying to trying to you know take a, a piece of the pie, trying to get in on, get in on the action. Mm-hmm. And this will have knock-on effects, so that you, you, this you see, period. These periods of time are then often associated with actual political conflicts. So you see in American politics the way this is played out, and not just not just American politics. You'll see this is when um, the kind of amity or unity of p- political class gets divided. So you get more. Um, um, conflicts and taking party lines like in Congress or the Senate, and you'll see more political polarization. Whereas in like the, in the fifties, pretty much everyone got along and they were all part of the same club. But as these starts of dynamics play out, then you get competition among the elites. And, um, one of, well, the, the thing about o- elite overproduction that Turchin says is that it's the best predictor of these revolutionary situations or these kind of crisis situations. Like if there's elite overproduction, that is the best predictor out of all of the, out of all of the bunch. So that I thought was a pretty, you know, pretty close. Well, I thought it was, it was pretty interesting how close Slobachevsky got. He was talking about just, um, like on a, on a general level, people being, um, like qualified people not being able to, to succeed essentially, or, and, or, and, not being able to kind of find the, like a, a, a prop, the, an ideal or even, you know, approaching ideal, um, like social adjustment for their, for their skills. But Turchin kind of, um, I think through his work has kind of like zeroed in on what actually, what the actual subset of that is. It's not just people in general, it's specifically within, um, within these, um, elite aspirants, you know, people who would, who, who would explicitly like to join the upper class. Like they might be, they might be totally, um, still totally qualified to, to do so, but they're not getting the, the, they're not getting the, the rewards and the, the privileges and the, the perquisites that they, that they think they should as a result of getting this degree. So, well, and, and you can, you can see how that would breed resentment when, um, you know, you, you do everything you're supposed to, you, you pay for your tuition, you, or, or you get a student loan, you know, expecting this big salary. You, you, you go to year to, to school for all these years, take grueling exams, and then either can't find a job in your profession or you find a job and it's just, it's a crappy job where you're not making much money. And so that, that breeds resentment among the, among the, the kind of middle class, upper class. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of sad because, um, um, well, it's just the way things work, but it's only with this cluster or this constellation of things going on that, that it actually makes a difference. If there weren't, if there wasn't elite overproduction going on, at least, you know, the, this is the way things look based on all this data, then, then, um, well, I'll, I'll phrase it differently. The way Turchin says, puts it is that, the only time that there is ever the chance for either a revolutionary climate um, or even just uh, like reforms or change or anything like that is when the the elites get involved in some way. Mm-hmm. So as long as the ruling classes are are happy with what they have and the way things are for them, mm-hmm. then it doesn't matter what's going on with the the people underneath. There might be there might be um, rebellions, revolts, things like that, but they're just crushed immediately or relatively quickly, there's kind of no hope. The only chance for any kind of rebellion or protest or, or revolution is when there's a disaffected part of the elites that get involved and then um, fund or support in some way the people on the bottom. Mm-hmm. So they, it, 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 is, it is essentially a patronage system. The, the, the disaffected among the, the masses need a patron within or a group of patrons within the the ruling classes in order to support them, basically give them money and support to, to be able to carry out their rebellion or their revolution. Otherwise, um, it's just pretty much hopeless. So that's actually one of those defining features is that 
um, through these through these cycles, it is the elite, elite overproduction that is the kind of the essential part of the equation for these things to all happen and gel. And of course, that's just one aspect of the theory, but I wanted to get that out there. Yeah. Well, um, he in the articles that I've read by him, he makes an interesting point of uh, looking at all of these dynamics as they apply to us right now mm -hmm. in contemporary political history and making the distinctions between uh, you know, what the left perceives uh, coming from the right wing of the political party vis-a-vis uh, -vis the support for Trump and the 2020 election and what the right to the supporters of Trump uh, what their perspective is uh, looking at the left's movement towards uh, towards certain um, uh, policies and developments. And I both liked and disliked that analysis of it. Uh, I liked it because it was uh, this kind of um, macro view of of the situation and exactly, you know, what fuels uh, dissent and the possibility for uh, a greater amount of crisis uh, to be developed. Um, I do think he he doesn't quite take as strong uh, of a position in some regards uh, regarding what may actually be a, a correct approach. Um, at, well, he does and he, and he doesn't. Uh, but the, you know, I, I, I only wish he it, it felt stronger to me. But what's valuable about it is, of course, this perception um, on the part of, say, the, the right, uh, the kind of middle of the road right, that is, not, not an ultra conservative or, or a totalitarian right, uh, but this kind of basic conservative, um, uh, what, what, how would you describe it in the US? Uh, kind of middle of the road, large, making up a large percentage of, of people, that uh, there, there are interests in the U.S. That, um, that are globalist in nature and would seek to export jobs and make very basic uh, avenues of making a living um, much more difficult. Um, so he touches upon that in, in various places, and I thought that was valuable uh, in and of itself. Um, there was another point that uh, that he was making about uh, crisis and and the points that we are at now, and that is once you've reached a kind of level of crisis that uh, that he both projected a few years ago and, and has been writing about in these past few years. Um, he calls it uh, the kind of uh, ginkgo um, model of societal crisis. He makes the analogy of a, a ginkgo leaf that has these striations that, that kind of go out in all these different directions. And the idea is that uh, uh, instability can manifest itself in any number of ways. And, and most of those ways, uh, if we look back at prior societies at, at different nations around the world that have suffered some form of revolution, they're all bad. Um, so he's, he's looking at this, uh, the situation where the elite have essentially not made the choice to uh, truthfully and effectively face the problems that we have as a society. And, um, and says that it's a major contributing factor to the probability that we're likely to see even more and bigger crises. And, and that's worrisome. I think it's something we all kind of know anyway uh, but it's it's interesting nonetheless to uh, read his analysis of it and look at his arguments. Um, I went uh, I went this morning to run some errands, and um, one of them was to a 
a snappy lube. This is one of those places that you, you drive into and you get some very quick service. They change your oil. They, uh, they check your tires. They look at all of the, the fluids, uh, the, the precious car, car fluids <laughs> that, uh, that you want to have uh, replenished. Uh, precious auto bodily fluids. <laughs> perfect. Um, and, they're, uh, and they're quick about it. And they know exactly what they're doing. With a smile on their face, right? And they had a big smile on their <laughs> face. And uh, this was a place I'd never been to before. And uh, I couldn't make an appointment with my, um, my regular mechanic. They, they were booked out for weeks. And the, 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 the place that was closer to me was unavailable for another week. And it was really time to change the oil and have a car looked at. So I went to this place I'd never been to before. And... Um, uh, the one uh, individual who I was talking to, who I remember speaking to on the phone the other day to see if I needed to make an appointment, uh, he was just the most uh, friendly and helpful and, and competent um, uh, snappy lube employee I had ever encountered, right? And I, you know, I, I was just very happy and impressed uh, with his service. And, um, and I thanked him and paid him and went on my way and was glad that he was there to do what he was there to do. I then had to uh, run an errand uh, to have uh, our vacuum cleaner um, checked out because uh, this was the second time in as many months that it wasn't working properly. And um, this vacuum cleaner service repair guy did a fantastic job uh, the first time. And, um, and this time he showed me where using an air compressor, uh, will, will clean out areas I had never cleaned before. And he, he showed me the parts. He took his time with me. He didn't want any money for the service. He educated me basically happy to do this competent at his job, knowledgeable. And I just, and I was thinking I was leaving both of these places so happy uh, that there were these people who were uh, good at their jobs, happy to be doing their jobs, content with making a living wage at their um, at their relatively blue collar working class jobs in their positions, uh, and I was I, I was just uh, very impressed for some reason. Um, it, it might in part be because I'm, I'm reading about uh, CEOs of, of Pfizer all the time and, and Moderna and, and politicians and, and how incompetent they are, as you described. And, and so to have somebody who is willing to do the work, to get on their, their hunches if necessary and go through something and get their hands dirty and do it with a smile made me very happy. Why do I bring this up? I bring this up because I think that there is a large number of individuals uh, in this country who more or less have the right idea about work and responsibility and going to a day job and giving it their all and doing it with a smile on their faces and being knowledgeable and being content with their station in life. And so, you know, and that, and and so when you when you realize that there's a whole segment of the population that you may not have direct experience with living in a city, but when you have a, a whole segment of the population that has uh, manufacturing jobs and and manual labor jobs that have been exported, that have been extracted out of the workforce because it would require a corporation to, to take money out of the bottom line. When you have such a di discontented portion of the population who realizes that they are not going to get a fair shake, they're not even on the scale, Harrison, of, of getting their first foothold into the elite ladder of, uh, of, of society. They, they just are having difficulty mm -hmm. with very basic uh, living standards. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to be on the dole from the government welfare checks. It's not in them. It's not part of their 
constitution. It's not in their moral taste buds. Uh, and many of them are only one or two generations away from the 1950s where Turchin describes, you know, you, you had a, a, a 50s and 60s and a little bit into the 70s, uh, a, a relatively stable society precisely because there was a better balance between um, uh, the, the numbers of elite earn, earning, you know, their top 1% and a population that could could earn what they needed to earn mm -hmm. and do it in a way that was a win-win situation. So uh, what, we, what we're seeing here, the Watiko virus, if you would, uh, the, the, the greed sickness um, at this very top has effectively disenfranchised a very large number of people. And we take this for granted we don't really realize just how um, injurious it is, not just for those individuals who, who don't have these opportunities because, because of this kind of new, you know, fourth turning movement that's extracting uh, avenues of employment and, and wage earning. But you have uh, this, um, they're just making it worse. They're just, they're just, turning the wheels even further, mechanizing everything to a greater degree, robotics, AI, technology, it's, it's becoming the kind of overarching um, globalist elite uh, uh, mechanism for production on steroids. And so uh, there really is no way out because like you said earlier, there there, ha there are very few real, sincere, active champions among the elite that we could see, we can count them on one hand, I think, who are, who are willing to go to bat and, 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 and bridge the gap between uh, the, the elite that are attempting to accrue even more money and even more influence to themselves. Well, I don't think it's not even a matter of of individuals that like individuals among the elite that might be you know champions for the for the underclass you might put it. It's uh, if you look at the the example of the fifties, there were two periods of what Turchin calls um, period times of good feelings, as he calls them. It was pretty much two decades in the entire you know in all of American history, the eighteen twenties and the nineteen fifties, and maybe a few years added on before or after, but predominantly those decades. And it really, the, the parts that, the parts that aren't structural demographic, like, like in the name of it, which are pretty much largely impersonal. Like there isn't, um, it, it pretty much, it's pretty, it pretty much plays out like clockwork, um, more or less the, the cultural factors that come in at least to the large scale dynamics are almost collective. They're, they have to do with trends among large groups of people. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, it, it's not even, I, I, I'd say it's probably, <clears throat> probably doubtful that any of those few individuals could actually do anything. Mm. You know, it might be, it might be great if, if, if they would show up and at least, you know, <laughs> give, give some, like, you know, give people a little bit of hope or whatever, but they're, it's, they're going to be one person among the crowd, even if they're in a in a position of of power. There's not much they can do to the to the forces that are among large groups of people, because the one of the things that he points out is in the I can't remember all the details, but like before and after the '50s, you had actual like changes in essentially like widely held beliefs and norms among the elite. So they, they basically changed like from the fifties to the sixties to the seventies. And it, it's almost like a, it, it, it's a, it's a cultural norm that gets accepted and they, that gets introduced. And so cultural norms change so that there's, there's that effect um, in these large scale dynamics, mm -hmm. but um, an individual isn't going to be able to change that necessarily. Well, maybe I'm just too cynical. Maybe it is possible, but you're, you're too cynical, but well, Hey, here's something to support my cynicism, and, and it, I'll it say never, something that's here, that, here's that something counters to that. Support my cynicism. It's never actually happened. Like if you look at history, it never happens. Well, how about uh, Roosevelt's Green New Deal? 
Well, but that was that was a Green New Deal, not Green New Deal, <laughs> the, 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 yeah. the, the New Deal. Well, but, I have Green New Deal but, on the mind. But that's he talks about that in the book too. That that was yeah. actually part of that was within these large scale trends. Mm-hmm. So it it happened at the right time. That's the only time it could have happened. You know, and there well, there's all kinds of stuff we could get into about the New Deal. But it you know if it basically. Um, it was moving in one direction, yeah. one way or another. It just yeah. so happened that Roosevelt was the one to like head it up. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, kind of like when one of the aspects that Turchin gets into uh, that you're talking about is something that he calls asabiya, which is... Uh, what, what, how does that? Asabiya. That was how it's spelled. <laughs> I have uh, no idea how it's uh, pronounced. How's it spelled? A-S-A-B-I-Y-A. Oh, yeah, I don't even know. He wrote about it in uh, War and Peace and War. Oh, okay. Um, this came from a, uh Islamic... Uh, scholar? Scholar, yeah. He was kind of like a, a sociologist before the time of uh-huh. sociologists. Uh, and he kind of like uh, uh, started with this idea, which is called Asabiya, but it's... What it means is social cohesion and ability of a group to to act in unison. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things that he talks about in War and Peace and War is the fact that like in the 50s, there was this uh, high point of asabiya, this this mm-hmm. high point of, of society to work together towards something. Mm-hmm. And so that's why you have so much uh, cooperation. That was why there was a thriving uh, community of like bowling leagues and elk elk lodges and and those kind of a thing those kinds of things is because there was this this high point of uh social cohesion and so when you have that you can you can do things together because it's all built on this trust that you have amongst everyone else that you trust them to do the right thing as they trust you to do the right thing Mm -hmm. and once that starts to break down well that's when you start to have all of these other problems pop up, which is largely impersonal, like you're saying. It's just that, um, you know, when you get down to the nitty gritty, you know, you have specific examples, but on the whole of it, it it's just the way that, you know, it kind of happens. So like, um, I guess what what you were talking about were the, the changes of the social norm mm-hmm. um, over time has become more uh, atomized individualistic materialism. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lower level of asabiya inherent in that Mm -hmm. because it's about you and not about working together for mutual cooperation and work or mutual good. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was an interesting way of, uh, looking at it that, uh, it's like now that I'm, because when I started reading War and Peace and War, there was uh, some things in there that, like, my brain automatically was like, no, no, mm-hmm. Be- because uh, of the way that he describes history and the way to look at and interpret history uh, is very different from, you know, just what we come to understand, because he's he's looking at this from <coughs> from a, a scientific perspective. He, he makes the analogy that... Uh, his Clio dynamics or Clio dynamics, however you want to pronounce it, he wants it to be a scientific understanding or approach to history. Mm -hmm. So kind of like how uh, seismologists study earthquakes and they can say, well, we have, you know, a a pretty good idea that there's probably going to be a good sized earthquake in this area sometime in the next, you know, 20 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm that doesn't mean they can predict exactly how big or exactly where or exactly what time mm-hmm. but it gives them a good a good range for being able to predict certain trends right and uh so that's kind of how he's approaching history as opposed to being like in the 18th century the rise of napoleon you know his troops did this that and mm-hmm. blah 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 mm-hmm. uh where history is defined by great men it seems more like you can actually define history by social dynamics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, so his approach and his books focus on the, the, the wide, like uh, the the wide, it's the widescreen edition, right? So Mm -hmm. you're looking at the, at the big picture, you're looking at trends that go, that spread across decades or even centuries. 
And that's not to say that the ind that individuals don't play an important role, but they play an important role within those larger trends. So you'll have like Roosevelt or or you know Trump today, who are who or or Biden or you know whoever's in power at any given time, playing an important role, but within within a larger scale trend that probably goes back generations, mm. and that will affect that the that will if affect the effect that they're able to have. And we got we got into this a bit in our show on the fourth turning, and that's another thing I wanted to bring up because. Um, I, I was looking for for stuff on sociological cycles after reading Ponderology, and that's and so you know years five years ago came across the fourth turning. I'm like, oh, this is pretty close. Um, Turchin identifies like the similarities between his between stru 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 structural demographic theory and um, what they call the Strauss and Howe call the generational theory, <clears throat> and there are some similarities to it, but there are important differences too. Um, first of all, just that generational theory hasn't been <clears throat> like scientifically um, tested and verified in the way that structural demographic theory has. It's more of a, like it is one of the criticisms I, I heard about it. Um, I think it was on, yeah, it was uh, the Unsafe Space podcast. They did a book club on it and and a lot of, or a few of them were saying that it's like astrology and it, it is a lot like astrology, fourth turning right. in, in the sense that, you know, they have the, they have the scheme and then they fit everything within the scheme without necessarily showing how it actually like, uh, for sure works like using, um, actual data. So you can, you can see, uh, like it still is fun and it, and it, and it makes sense, but I th I'm wondering if maybe it makes sense in a, in, in the sense that there are aspects of it that are true that just haven't been tested and verified yet, and how much of it just happens to to coincide with with a better theory, for example, like maybe with with a structural demographic theory, because some of the similarities, for example, are that both um, and he talks about another another approach too. I can't remember which one it is, but uh, maybe it was just the two. Um, but both predict that this is this specifically the time we're living in is a crisis period. Mm -hmm. They both have a, a generational element to it. In in Turchin's case, um, the only thing he was able to to find was a two generation cycle, which he calls the fathers and sons cycle, which is a cycle of um, how does he call it? I think it's political violence. So there's a fifty year political violence cycle, and he was able to. To model that to a pretty good, you know, degree of accuracy, how that actually plays out using using just a few metrics, a few um, um, a few factors. Like uh, he he divides people the, the entire population into um, naives, so people who who haven't uh, taken a political position one way or the other. Then you've got the the people that become radicalized in a certain situation, and then the moderates who were former radical radicals that have kind of realized the error of their ways. And just by playing with those three like um, demographics and how, how those numbers shift, then he can pretty much exactly replicate the 50 year cycle. It's pretty much, that's why he calls it the fathers and sons cycle because it's two generations and basically a new generation will be born that hasn't had, that hasn't been able to be radicalized or um, uh, radicalized or de-radicalized in a political sense, a political violence sense. And so they, they, that new generation is now the, the pool from which radicals can be pulled. And then it just plays itself out. So it repeats every two generations, but they're the part of, and, and that plays out in American history. Every 50 years, there's an outbreak of political violence and we're in one currently. And the last one was in the late sixties. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so what before then was, um, well, well, there's a graph, and but the the only one that didn't have the only one that didn't match the the rule was the 1820s, there or was the 1850s, one of the two, but um, um, I think it was the 1820s where there should have been an outbreak of violence, but the way he explains uh, he explains it because of all these other features that had contributed to that being the era of good feelings as it was called, um, totally mitigated that effect so that the it pretty much canceled out the the possibility of there being any widespread political radicalization during that time. But other than that, it comes back like clockwork. And it, but and it's not every it's, but it's not a 
it's not a rule. So it doesn't always happen because there are exceptions like that. And it doesn't always show up in all society's data. So there's still questions around that. So there is a generational aspect to it, but, but the generational theory is a 90 year cycle, more or less, you know, four generations, 90 to hundred years. And so by looking at that, you'd think that everything should cycle every 90 to hundred years. And by looking at, you know, by reading Strauss and how you'd think, oh, it does, because they've kind of, you get the sense that they've kind of cherry picked the data to make it fit, right? But when you look at all kinds of societies, all kinds of empires, um, you look at American society, the mm -hmm. cycle isn't 90 years. The cycles are like Lobachevsky said, when, and he was he was citing, I think, uh, Patiram Sorokin, who was an early guy doing this anal these, these types of analyses on pre-industrial societies, the cycle's like 200 to 300 years. That's how, lo that's how long these cycles have been traditionally in pre-industrial societies. Um, so centuries long. And it, so it takes at least, you know, two centuries to get through an entire cycle. And that's, so that's an interesting thing about pre-industrial societies. And in those cases, um, there are some differences between pre-industrial and modern industrial societies that he gets into. So in those pre-industrial societies, for instance, if you just take one of them, there isn't going, uh, like large scale immigration is more of a modern thing. So in a lot of these societies, they didn't have large scale um, immigration and they were um, primarily agrarian societies. So this is where like Malthusianism comes in and why, why, um, why one of the aspects, he calls one of the aspects of of structural demographic theory, neo-Malthusian, because it's not uh, it's not Malthusian in the, in the the wide sense. Um, it's strictly in the sense of in an agrarian in an in an agrarian society, you've got a certain amount of of arable land, and when you have too many, it, it's kind of like with elite overproduction. When you have too many people on the on the on the farmland, it can't carry that many people, and they move to the cities. So there's a demographic shift. Um, the the land can't su the the farmland can't support that many people as it is and maybe it could if they could create more farmland or or whatever but the fact is they don't have that much farmland and the people need somewhere to go and they don't want to starve so they move to the, move to the cities so the the primary um, mover you know mover and shaker in in agrarian societies was uh, demography it was population growth when population growth gets too big people move to the cities that lowers wages that that increases um, um, popular immiseration um, among the among the masses. You get more elite aspirants now wanting to enter the upper class. You get a wider disparity between the the rich and the and the poor. So you have this popular. You, you have this widespread immiseration of the of the the working class or the peasants. And you have now you have um, intra elite competition. And then you've the the, the, the third aspect is the um, state fiscal crisis. So you've got the, those three together um, are the three factors that he puts into his political stress index, which is kind of what Lobachevsky was looking for, was adv advising to, to create was a political stress index to show when societies are kind of like reaching the breaking point. And that's how industrial or pre-industrial societies played out. Now with modern in industrial, modern industrial societies, like in the US, the cycle has been shorter. So the first cycle of American history was, I think, 150 years. Um, the, uh, the United States has gone through one complete cycle and we're kind of in partway through the second cycle. And we're in the crisis phase of the second cycle. So the first one played out in 150 years. And he, he argues that the reason for that was because of, because of modern Im immigration policies. Um, that that, well, immigration immigration and technology, like there's a whole bunch of things that contribute, but at least in the population department, when you add in kind of like artificial um, population growth in the form of immigration, that's going to have an effect on these economic and, and structural processes. And it has the effect of, in, in this case, shortening the cycle from two to 300 years to 150 years. So it plays out in a shorter amount of time. <clears throat> and I think in some of his articles, he he points out that well this because I get the I get the impression that he's probably more more liberal than he is conservative, mm -hmm. but at the same time, um, he he points out well this is kind of why conservatives 
think the way they think about immigration is because this contributes to, to what's going on. Like, like immigration isn't always and just a good thing. Um, that, that seems to be one of the problems of, uh, just politics in general is picking a policy and then just thinking that it's all completely evil or all completely good. So all immigration all the time must be good and there cannot be anything bad with it. Well, it's like, no, maybe in certain periods of, maybe in certain periods in the cycle, you know, immigration is helpful, but at others it can be, um, not very helpful. And it actually, that's, it's actually one of the contributors to a low, to the lowering of the, of the wage or wage stagnation. And also then contributes to elite overproduction and, and inter elite competition and all this stuff. So, um, kind of looking at, looking at things in terms of cycles like this reminds me of in a, in a kind of rhyming way with what, uh, Jordan Peterson says about liberal liberals and conservatives is that sometimes, you know, and at certain times you need conservatives and then you need liberals to, to, you know, add a little bit more chaos to the system. And then you need, then after that, you need conservatives to bring a bit more order to the system. There's, there's, there's times when, um, time, times when the approach of each is necessary and just sticking to one approach for, for all time, isn't going to, isn't going to help. It's not, uh, th things are going to, to decay in some sense. They're either going to turn to total chaos or kind of like this totalitarian order. So there needs to be a balance between, between those forces. And so similar to, to looking at things in this perspective, at certain times, certain policies are going to be beneficial and other times they're not going to be. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just a, it's an interesting, it's an interesting approach and, and way to see just what happens because I think it's very easy to get to, to have like um, this myopia, this like nearsightedness when looking at what's going on. We're just seeing what's going on and thinking, thinking either that it's completely new or, oh, if, you know, if these idiots just did this thing, then things would be better mm -hmm. and not seeing that, oh, well, it's, we're actually here on the cycle. These cycles have happened in all, you know, all modern and well, all modern societies or all, um, all societies for the past 3000 years. And we just happen to be here on the cycle and the same shit happens every time. So we shouldn't be surprised, but maybe we can actually learn something about, you know, maybe we can find a, a life hack for, for these cycles. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think he argues that that's, that's, that's the hope that he offers that he, that he has is that it's at least theoretically possible that, that understanding these things that, that we can like flatten the curve, <laughs> so to speak. Right. Um, but, but without that, we're just going to keep going mindlessly through these cycles because, because people don't, don't understand them and don't plan for them. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, Wait, wanna, go ahead. well, yeah, it's, uh, without a solid understanding of what's actually going on, you'll never be able to, mm -hmm. uh, do what you <laughs> hope for, mm -hmm. because if you are, uh, looking at it in one way, and it's actually structured a different way. Well, when you do X, you're going to produce D instead of Y. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, that's why he has this hope of, you know, if we can zero in on this and in, in some kind of like reasonable way, then we can realize what's going on and be like, oh, here we are. This is what's actually going on. Mm -hmm. And then we can, I guess, get out of our own like myopic Mm -hmm. uh, view of the situation. Oh, it's not all crazy liberals. Oh, it's not all evil conservatives. This is a, a bigger thing at play here mm -hmm. and we can step out of ourselves and, and get over ourselves, uh, to the point where we can actually, you know, work together to, to make things, uh, mm -hmm. not as tumultuous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was, I'd read this book before reading Philip Barleg's book, uh, Evil Roman Emperors. So mm -hmm. I was reading, I was reading that book with this in mind. And um, in Secular Cycles, they have one of the chapters is on um, a few, two or three of the the Roman cycles. So kind mm -hmm. of the pre-Republican Roman cycle, and then the um, <clears throat> I can't remember where they where they precisely. Oh, the, well, the first, at least one of the cycles ends around like 40 BC after, after the assassination of Julius Caesar. And then Augustus kind of starts the new, the new secular cycle in Rome. And so I was reading, I was reading that with that in mind. 
And coming back to what we were talking about earlier about, you know, having a leader in a p particular time and place, Caesar was right at, in the crisis period at the end mm -hmm. of the Roman Republic. So it's like um, r reading, reading kind of his approach and what he was trying to do. It's like he didn't really have a chance, but, you know, he, he tried, <laughs> you know, he tried tried probably better than than anyone could have but he was he was living in um in a bad time essentially where when things were bound to bound to go wrong in all in all sorts of ways yeah and and he wasn't the only political figure uh in ancient rome that attempted to do this you had the gracchi brothers who were um stalwart uh forces for reform in ancient Rome, and they were both torn asunder mm -hmm. and had very strong political enemies that roused the passions of the people who didn't know any better or, you know, hired thugs basically to hunt these guys down. And, um, and so, you know, they didn't really have a chance, even though they were, they saw the same, pretty much the same problem, which is that you had the, these group, this group of optimates or the oligarchy or the elite. Uh, that were just not making any concessions to, uh, or making enough concessions to the, the, the basic needs and, and wants of the vast majority of the population. And uh, so Turchin makes the point in, in one of his articles that what's required of, um, of, of moving forward is also a certain measure of sacrifice on the part of the elites. Uh, he doesn't get too specific of that in, in the readings that I've read, but, you know, and we, and we don't, we certainly don't know what form it would take, but certainly when you understand that there is a, um, a, a myopic is, is one good word as you used before that, that that's the word that came to mind, but it's even worse than that because the, the, uh, the urge, the, the, the greed, the, um, the drive to uh, have money and power uh, and more and more of it is on such a level of sickness in many quarters in our financial industry, in, uh, in politics, in, uh, in a large number of corporations, um, that how do you even begin to uh, to go beyond the theoretical, for instance, and get thousands upon thousands of people who are who are in these various areas of government and and the private sector on the couch so that they can discuss their sickness ain't gonna happen. <laughs> and and the alternative, what's the alternative? Revolution? I don't think anybody wants that either. We're not. Uh, well, some people do. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I say we, I mean. I mean, us here, we, we, yeah. we know just how awful such a eventuality is, even though, you know, it, it may be satisfying on some level to see uh, resistance to the, um, the, the kind of totally unreasonable uh, policies and, and effects of totalitarian thinking and, uh, and social um, New, new social laws and, and of all of all sorts. Uh, so it, it's yeah. I mean, he's not wrong. Um, it is a little unsatisfying, and I guess for me, another reason why you know panorology makes such a it's it answers so many questions because even if you can't, even if you don't exactly have the uh, the the solution, you know, you can't go to Congress or or you can't go into a, a kind of union of of companies or or the intelligence agencies and say, gentlemen, we believe that you're you exhibit a a high degree of pathology and we'd like you to uh, to to do something about that and do some inner work that's that's not really <laughs> tenable. Um, but for ourselves uh, to have this understanding. Uh, that's what we're facing, I think. Um, instead of being misdirected, for instance, uh, at the top of the show, you know, we, we talked about this inequality being such a, a major factor and people's attentions and energies have been diverted 
and and bait and switched to systemic racism and to other things where I think, you know, 15, 20 years ago, you had a, a lot of people or, or even 10 years ago with a, a better grasp in many, you know, more progressive circles or, or middle of the road circles about the the real problems, the real systemic issues that most uh, Americans and individuals in the West are facing. So, um, so, well, uh, one of the reasons why Turchin's able to to have this kind of a, a view, and the reason why it works, is because people are people. Just like plain and simple, as like as mm -hmm. far as we've come technologically, people are still jealous, mm -hmm. greedy, selfish mm -hmm. bastards. A lot of the time, I mean, it doesn't mean they can't be good in various other respects, but uh, people still act selfishly uh, mm -hmm. in times of crisis, um, and. It's also kind of the the nature of the beast when you have a, a hierarchical society that the people who would want to or aspire to become uh, heads of state uh, or heads of corporations are the people who are the most sick um, in terms of their uh, greed uh, or in terms of their uh, self delusions of grandeur. Um, that's that's part of. Yeah, it's part of the nature of the beast. Um, so there's there's kind of no way around that except, you know, for a large enough number of the population to have some kind of like understanding of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, also to uh, work on themselves in some respect, because it, a lot of this stuff wouldn't happen if uh, people took a more stoic approach to life. You know, if the elites, instead of seeing that, you know, there's this... Uh, new large class of upstarts trying to to make their way into into their uh milieu uh instead of saying like no we can't have that because i i'm you know instead of being greedy and selfish it's just kind of like taking a stoic approach of like you know i was able to take care of you know i was able to have and to yeah take care of this amount of wealth and you know this property and such for for this amount of time it was never going to be forever and uh, just kind of like not caring about it because that's not <coughs> who they are or what matters to them. But that's obviously like never going to happen. Never yeah. going to happen. So no, and that's that's it's kind of I'm not sure yet if it's a depressing aspect of the book. I'll have to think about it more. But um, mm -hmm. because well, one potentially depressing thing is that the best time periods are the time periods where the elite class is the most um unified yeah. and like separated from society it's like mm -hmm. the, the most clearly defined and uh and so i'm i'm used to to looking at periods of time like that in in the worst light possible um but and even when reading it you see you know there's from a from a like a leftist socialist perspective there's never a good time right there's mm -hmm. always it's well, the only good time probably is when people are the most miserable because then you can have a revolution. But otherwise, there's always things to criticize, right? There's always things that uh, that's you can look at from a certain perspective and say, oh, it's just terrible. This is the way things are. Well, it, it just so happens that one of those terrible things is, you know, maybe or, or maybe not objectively, is these periods of, of stability. And, um, well, no, I won't. I was going to talk about the closing of the patriciate, but but no, I won't. I'll leave that for people who want to just read the book. But um, the oh, I was going to say one other depressing thing. Yeah, about people just being people. Um, one of the th one of the advantages I think of looking at things in this way is that uh, you can adopt the, the stoic approach of seeing that this is just the way that societies function. There will always be um, social stratification. There will mm -hmm. always be uh, a ruling class, some better than others, mm -hmm. um, and there will there will at least until we potentially find a way of of flattening the curve, <laughs> there will always be these cycles. There will always be, um, as he calls it, immiseration of of the masses. There will always be um, all of these things. They're just they're just normal. Mm -hmm. They're just the way things work, and 
Um, so with that in mind, I, I think that would have a tempering effect on kind of on some people and the, the level of, um, like disaffection and, um, um, like revolutionary sentiment and that sort of thing by, by seeing that, okay, you know, it's just the way things are. Maybe I should just learn to, to deal with my life and live within it and try mm-hmm. to try to deal with it as, as well as I possibly can and not try to fight these like large scale historical yeah, because forces. The more they try and fight it is, uh, it's the worse that those kinds of things become. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So there's that, and there's always going to be uh, a ruling elite now. And it's like, and going back to the thing that uh, you mentioned, Alan, about uh, about your experiences going out and just talking to people and experiencing people actually working and doing their jobs. Um, one of the things that Lobachevsky points out is that that's what most people are like. If they're able to find, you know, their a place um, and have a relatively decent level of common sense, is that most people are fine. With that, most people are fine making a living wage. Most people are fine, um, or or a bit more, a bit less, or whatever. Like most people, most people don't tend to be resentful of people in a better position than them if those people, if they can see that those people deserve it in some way. Like no one, no sane person, no rational person is totally jealous of some virtuoso violinist because. They're a virtuoso violinist, and they get big concerts and and have some degree of of like fame in the violinist community or the you know the <laughs> classical music listening community. Mm-hmm. No, they admire it. And if you have a really good job or a really good boss, you admire your boss. You get along with them, right? It's it's that's that's what a that's one aspect of what a healthy society looks like is that people understand that. People have different talents and people are better placed in different positions Mm -hmm. and they're fine with it. And in fact, get something out of it. Like people enjoy watching the Olympics. They enjoy watching people who are excellent people or people who are beautiful or people that are extremely talented. People enjoy that inequality. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, And even if it might hurt to admit it, they, they, people get immense amounts of satisfaction, enjoyment, and uh, like fulfillment out of it, the inequality, not only of themselves, but of others, because everything they, everything they like and appreciate about the cultural world is the result of some inequality. It's the result of someone having a massive amount of talent that you don't have. Mm-hmm. And that's great because I don't have it. So, so naturally I have to look to someone else for it because if I can't, you know, if I can't write the ninth symphony, well, I'm pretty, you know, I'm pretty glad that Beethoven was able to, um, because otherwise there would be no ninth there symphony. There would be no ninth symphony. There would be no, you know, masterworks. So, um, well, I did yeah. just want to get back to something you said a moment ago and you as well, Adam, and that is, uh, this, this stoic approach to cycles in societies and the fact that, uh, in, in many cases, or at least in some cases, these trends towards, uh, stability and instability can can be traced or the outlines of them can be seen and and people being people and and the development of societies being the development of societies we can just come to uh expect these developments to take their course over a large period of time and when when you guys were talking about that i thought well you know what there is something to be said for a uh a a certain level of distance, a certain level of healthy kind of um, understanding uh, that that this perspective might afford somebody, so that they're not drawn in and and pulled this way and that and and made to feel reactive and and uh, induced to react to certain things. And so uh, one question in my mind to have about all of this is when you know what the, what the specific mechanisms are for instability, for instance, when you, when you see that, that this incredibly powerful individual has his thumb on these organizations and is able to pay for this movement and able to create this disturbance and is able to... Uh, 
to make you know this uh, economic condition uh, even worse for a large segment of the population. So, where does where does that fit in, if at all, into one's um, experience of of looking at our society, of looking at its developments? Uh, do we do we take as stoic an approach? Do we uh, do we allow ourselves to get frustrated and well, and uh, and well, the thing to about some the stoic degree? approach is that it applies in all situations. <laughs> yes, uh, but I, but I'm even questioning to some degree the uh, we can't be stoic about everything. Or, that's, or that's maybe the goal of stoicism. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, uh, or or maybe I would say that. Um, it, well, you can address it we, without we wanna... necessarily driving <clears throat> towards some kind of reactionary solution to, to, to quote unquote, fix it. Right. Uh, you can take the example of Jeff Bezos and his specially designed rocket. Rocket man. <laughs> <laughs> um, as, as being part of the, uh, the ostentatious show of the elites who, who buy these uh, overly expensive conspicuous consumption conspicuous consumption uh is just another example of that on a on a grander scale um that i think accurately looked at simply gets put into the already set out framework it's just another part uh of this whole thing that uh you know it's it's not new and it's not outside of the scope uh, we just have to change how we view the scope or like what we put within the scope. Mm -hmm. um, just as a, as an interesting uh, note on that aspect though, um, there was in war and peace and war, uh, Turchin describes at one point how he expected there to be a rise of an Islamic caliphate within the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And this was in 2007. And sure enough, what do we have? But ISIS mm -hmm. uh, that that comes up and uh, comes up being supported by the very same people that it was supposed to be rising up against, if that makes sense. But the thing is that even though it did have support from some Western powers, it still could not have thrived and gotten as big as it did had those other factors not been there to begin with. Mm -hmm. Because if there was no unrest, if there was no anger or outrage mm -hmm. at what had been done, mm -hmm. there would be no emotional reason for these people to give up their lives yeah. in order to, to go forth and, you know, conquer. So it was capitalized on, it was, it was uh, leveraged uh, for, for, um, well, certain I, I think Adam's purposes. point is that it can only be capitalized on and leveraged if there are the existing conditions, that, that, yeah. you know, the, 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 the soil in which it can grow and, uh, yeah, yeah fertile ground. That's, mm. well, I'll just get back to, uh, fleshing out that point. Is there a, is there a, a place at which becoming, uh, being stoic Harrison, you, you said, no, stoicism pretty much applies to, you know, it's kind of a, it's not, well, I'm stoic about this, but I'm not yeah. stoic about that. It's, it's a lifestyle, man. It's a lifestyle. We're going to get you the t-shirt. Um, <laughs> but is there, a, is, there a, is there a place at which uh, stoicism can be dogmatic and even um, narrowing? Well, uh, it depends how, how you're defining stoicism. I'd say, like, by definition, the like a stoic sage would not be dynamic, do dogmatic anytime, even mm -hmm. though he's completely stoic and like the ideal of, of stoicism. Um, wh well, so I guess we can get into this. So what do you, what's your point? Like, what do you actually mean? What would an example of taking your stoicism too far be? Uh, I think, so we don't want to get carried away with our emotions, for instance. We don't want to be so upset by a piece of news that we're reading that we're left in a tizzy and dysfunctional 
and uh, reactive and, and basically losing ourselves to uh, a piece of news or information, mm -hmm. uh, that much is clear. We, we, we strive for balance and, uh, and a healthy approach to, to, to life and to developments as we see them around us all the time. Uh, that much should be said right off the bat. Um, by the same token, um, and I guess this is a, you know, it's kind of a difficult question I'm asking because every situation is different. Every circumstance is different. Every, uh, we're different from moment to moment in many cases. Um, so uh, we can, we can approach different stimuli, different information, different developments um, with a, a varying degree of stoicism. But where does, um, I, guess, I guess stoicism, if it, if it doesn't uh, restrict one from acting upon in a constructive way, maybe I'm answering my own question here. Uh, if, if stoicism makes us too indifferent to certain things, uh, oh. detached. Is there, is there even a danger of, of, or not a danger, that's too strong a word, but is there even a concern for that sort of thing? And who knows, maybe we need to do a, sh a show on stoicism. Another one? And, and, and Yes, another one, and, and break it down. It's such a darned interesting uh, approach. Well, um, okay, I think I can kind of understand where you're, where you're coming from, because inequality in a drastic degree is detrimental to society as a whole and also to the individuals within that society. So it's right for someone to recognize it for what it is and to speak the truth about it. Like, hey, you, you can't just keep going like this and expect nothing to happen. So so it doesn't preclude the possibility of voicing an opinion mm -hmm. or even supporting some sort of, of change, mm -hmm. but rather it directs how you interact with that, mm -hmm. how you, rem I guess, uh, remain detached from it to the extent to where you don't become controlled by the, uh, the need for change. So you are able to accept your lot in life and realize there's only so much you can do mm -hmm. and uh, only so much things can, can be changed by, by you alone or even you with a group of people. You can accept that and work to the best of your ability with what you have at your disposal to, to make your life and the life of those around you as uh, good as possible while at the same time... Um, yeah, just speaking, speaking the truth, I guess would be the thing about it is, you know, you can uh, take care of what you got and, you know, learn about as much as you can speak out where you uh, find it uh, appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, but understanding that, you know, as an example, uh, supporting critical race theory and, tr and becoming a critical race theorist and calling for a complete restructuring of society and getting rid of uh, capitalism entirely and all of those kinds of things is not going to lead to anything good. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's where the stoic approach comes in is it allows you to uh, make the best of your situation and not try to uh, make reality conform to your beliefs. Um, at the same time, giving everything it's, it's due. Sold. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we'll wrap it up. I'll just uh, give one more interesting factoid that wasn't in the, it may be in one of his books, but I saw it on his blog, that uh, periods of crisis, um, well, all of the great plagues, or at least, you know, there's a, there's a strong correlation between the great plagues of history and the crisis periods of these secular cycles. So um, 
which seems to be a remarkable coincidence, right? That uh, that plagues would would happen to hit. You'd think that a plague would cause a crisis, right? Naturally, but the fact that it 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 times that the plague s- somehow matches to, manages to time itself with the the pre existing trends, mm-hmm. um, he argues that that's the case. The, the reason that's the case, at least one reason for it, would be that in that crisis period, it's essentially um, a society is essentially in a what would the word be like a, a weakened health state you know you're more susceptible to disease so it may be the case that uh, a lot of the 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 plague pathogens or whatever that are going around just can't get a foothold in when a society is healthy but during the, the periods of time when they're declining health is going down the tubes people are people are poorer people are you know starting to starve to death that's when a plague can have its greatest uh greatest impact so i just thought that was interesting um another topic for another time but uh yeah on, yeah on, on that positive note yeah <laughs> take care everyone thanks thanks for listening enjoy the plague